Yeah, I, you're right. My criticism is a lot more nuanced than that. I'm, there's no question that it's warmer now than it was in the 19th century. The, the battleground issue is whether it's warmer now than in the 11th century and whether the data that we have enables you to say that with any degree of certainty. One of the emails in the Climategate letters is from uh, Keith Briffa, who says that it was his opinion that it was as warm a thousand years ago as it is today. That's something that he doesn't say in the IPCC reports, and it's disquieting to read that in this correspondence. L let me go to John Roberts. John, you spent the day at, at the university that is ground zero for this whole controversy. What's been their reaction, their response to the, to the furor here? Well, well, they know that it looks bad uh, from a public relations standpoint. They know that it has had an impact on this prestigious institution, the uh, Climatic Research Unit and the, uh, the scientists who work there. But they do stand firmly behind the science. Uh, they say, like one of your guests, that if, even if you take out the work that they've been doing there, there are so many other uh, institutions around the world that have found similar things. And some of those institutions are NASA and NOAA. I, I have a, a, a question for Stephen McIntyre, if I could. And it's good to talk to you, Mr. McIntyre. McIntyre, uh, because your, your name has certainly come up a lot in the research that uh, I've been doing over the last uh, uh, few days here surrounding this. That tree ring record, I talked to Michael Mann about it. He said it became unreliable in the 1960s for reasons other than a temperature decline. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Well, no one knows why it became unreliable or whether the unreliability uh, uh, existed in earlier periods. The the, the most reasonable interpretation of it is that you can't use these particular records to estimate temperatures in the past and therefore the the problem is trying to make more of these tree ring records than you really can and, and let me let me get a bottom line sort of uh, account from you sure. in, in your view um, let, let me make two points number one is to the point of a massive fraud individual scientists are people big news uh, they're fallible but if you accuse the scientific community of a fraud, you have to say that the 2,500 scientists that are part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are part of a massive conspiracy. You have to say that the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, which looked at this specific issue several times, is part of a conspiracy. You have to say that the Bush administration, which conducted its own review of climate change, is part of a massive conspiracy. I'm sorry, I don't buy that. All right, stand by, everybody. Uh, I want to keep you guys with us. We're, we're going to do a little bit more of a fact check if we can here. We want to try to separate some of the opinions, some of the political uh, views, and, and try to get a more bottom line view that is grounded in science. Tom Foreman is at the magic wall for us. He's going to try to break that down when we come back. And then I want to get your reaction to what Tom says. Stay with us. Emails couldn't come at a worse time. This week's Copenhagen summit has been two years in the making. Getting 200 nations to the bargaining table, not easy. And now this email controversy threatens to undermine the negotiations. So we thought we would do a little reality check on climate change. Uh, look at what we do know, what we don't know. And Tom Foreman is here to break it down to try to separate fact from fiction for us. Tom, take it away. Well, Campbell, this is what we're talking about in this big theory, at least one of the things. This little molecule out there, carbon dioxide, I'll make it bigger so you can really see it. One part carbon, two parts oxygen. This is the thing, one of these greenhouse gases we've talked about, that is blamed by the people who believe in this for trapping gases on the Earth. We actually know scientifically these do help trap gases. The question is, why are there so many of them? Let's look at how this is caused. I'm going to turn around my little molecule here. I'm wide it out to look at this. This is the Earth. And there are a lot of natural sources of CO2, for example. Volcanic eruptions can cause them. Animal, human, plant respiration can cause them. And something called the ocean atmosphere exchange. This has to do with the rate at which water and plants and other things does, uh, absorb CO2 and help get rid of it in our atmosphere. But there are also human sources of CO2 that we do know about. For example, industrial facilities, automobiles, power plants, deforestation as we cut down trees which absorb CO2, we might allow more of it to be in the environment. Again, I'm not trying to take any stance here. I'm just trying to talk through the science of it. So we have these two different sources here, the natural sources and the human sources, all feeding the Earth. And the theory of global warming is that while the Earth is covered with all this atmosphere around here, 
the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases increase. Those allow sunlight to come in, but the heat that it causes cannot escape so easily back through those gases. So in effect, they form a big blanket or a big fleece all around the world, and the theory is that's what's making it get hotter because there are more of those gases, in theory, because there's more of what we're doing here, Campbell. All right, so despite the theory, Tom, how, how do we know this is happening? One of the ways we know, Campbell, is because we have taken pictures of it. Take a look at this. This is pictures that have been taken by NASA of carbon dioxide emissions in the world. Look at this. All these red spots in here are the areas where there is more carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere. And if you think about it, where are they? Well, look, here's the United States, highly industrialized California. Lots and lots of people, lots and lots of cars over here on the East Coast, drifting off here over into Europe, on into Russia, into Asia, this area. So the argument is this is one of the real issues here. So look at what the supporters of this here say. The supporters say what we're facing right now is a serious problem, that humans really are major contributors to this problem, and immediate action must be taken now. They say in many ways we're talking about possibly a tipping point where we won't even be able to bring that the heat of the climate back under control. But the skeptics, these people you've been talking to, say, look, there is an unknown impact here. We don't really know how severe this is. This could be largely or partially natural, and maybe it's not really our fault, and the action to deal with this would be very expensive and could be premature. They say we've got a lot more time to study this and figure out if we're right or wrong. Again, not taking any stances on this, Campbell, but that's the general sense of where we stand when we look about why this is happening and what the two different arguments are about what we should or shouldn't do about it. Campbell? All right, Tom Foreman for us, breaking it down. Uh, you have heard, certainly, about the Climate Research Unit that is at the center of this hacked email scandal, but only CNN went inside to ask the tough questions. We have an exclusive report for you just ahead. But next, we are going to get to the bottom line on what Tom just laid out for us. The global warming issue, is it fact, is it fiction? Our guests, our skeptics, our scientists, all here to comment on that. Maybe even find a little common ground. We'll see when we come back. Megan, to try to hammer out uh, a plan to deal with climate change. And meanwhile, of course, the Obama administration did take an unprecedented step here at home. The EPA declared there is scientific evidence that global warming from greenhouse gas emissions does pose a threat to Americans' health. So as the debate rages on over those stolen emails from climate researchers in England, it raises this question. Why don't we just clean up the environment anyway? So let's bring back our guests to talk about that. Stephen McIntyre, Michael Oppenheimer, uh, Chris Horner, and our own John Roberts with us. And Michael, I, I, I just want to start with you. You say that even if you throw out all those damning emails, get, you take them completely out of the equation, uh, you still say the evidence is overwhelming. So what is the most persuasive piece of evidence to you? Well, to be clear about it, the connection between greenhouse gases like CO2, carbon dioxide, and global warming is as solid as the link between smoking and lung cancer, it's that simple. But beyond that, one of the reasons that scientists aren't saying, well, let's study this some more, is that once carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere, it stays there for decades, for centuries, even for a millennium or longer. So that some of the emissions we're making today are still gonna be in the atmosphere a thousand years from now. And that means the actions we take or fail to take today are committing our children, our grandchildren, and future generations to climate change indefinitely. That's why action is needed now. Uh, Chris Horner, you're laughing. Why? Because climate changes. That's what it does. It always has. It always will. Oddly, it's not warming. In fact, it's been cooling. That's the trend. And the projections in the refereed literature are that the cooling will continue for decades. And let's just accept all of the hysteric scenarios. Nothing ever proposed would, according to anybody, detectably impact the climate. So this is a gesture at best, and what you want to do is leave the world wealthier to deal with something you're always going to have to deal with, not poorer. All the scenarios in the world won't change that. But, but let me but, but take the scenarios out of it. I, I mean, what's, what's wrong with having cleaner air and cleaner water, Chris? 
Wonderful. Let's, we're off of the end of the world thing, right? Great. That's progress. Uh, if you want to clean up the air, we have regimes in place for that. If you want to tighten them, we do that during economically vibrant times, and only wealthy economies do it. Go to Haiti and ask them about their Clean Air Act and come back and talk to me. The fact is, if you want to chase SO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, or mercury emissions, the most expensive, least efficient way to do it is as a co-benefit of trying to ration carbon dioxide emissions. Economists will all tell you that, and I'm sure sci other scientists would agree. Uh the fact is, if you want clean, wealthier is healthier, wealthier is cleaner, you're not going to clean up the environment by chasing CO2. Go ahead, Michael, and then I'm going to bring if Stephen CO2, into this. cleaning up CO2 was such an economic loser, why are the Chinese investing in hybrid cars? Why have they become the world's leading solar energy because manufacturer? Excuse yeah, me, let, let, me, let, let him point. make his point, Chris. The point please. is, they know, as we should know, that the future of technology is going to be green technology and that there is going to be money and jobs and frankly I don't want to see the Chinese eating our lunch mm. I want to get there first we can both save the world from global warming and have a new economy which will prosper if we move ahead to develop these technologies that's what we ought to be doing. Stephen as our skeptical scientist here in the mix